am Daniel Adibi, and I will be your host for Our World 101, the show in which we explain complicated, real-world events and issues to bridge people together. Very briefly, the movement started in 2013 after the killing of Trayvon Martin, an innocent 17-year-old Black student. The purpose of the movement is to protest and end all violence against Black people provoked by racism, although there is a much deeper meaning of over 400 years of oppression. When I thought hard about doing this episode, I wanted to have an African-American guest come onto the show to share his or her experience. But the more I studied the movement, the more apparent it became that, for the most part, the Black community was frustrated from continuing to bear the burden of educating non-Black Americans. They've been doing it for so long, and it is now our responsibility to ask questions and to educate ourselves. Part of the missing link to ending racism is involving white people in the discussions about racism. Here to talk to us today is New York Times best-selling author, activist, educator, and public speaker, Kate Schatz. Welcome to the show, Ms. Schatz. Thank you so much, Daniel, and um, what a thoughtful uh, intro. I, Thank I you. That the, art, the articulation that you just laid out is, uh, I want to use that as an example um, right there for how non-Black people can talk about and understand uh, the larger movement. Um, as well as the complex nuances of who talks about it and why. So thank you for, for being so thoughtful. Thank you so much. Um, I know you can help us understand how we can get involved in this movement. And it is really, as one mentor told me, a non-political movement. It's a movement that states that Black lives should matter. We are really excited to have you here. Yeah, thank you so much. And I, I, I really agree with what your mentor said. And that's another thing I would echo is that um, you know, human rights should not be political. You know, it shouldn't be about one party or the other. Um, equality and basic human dignity shouldn't be something that divides us on political lines. It should be something that <laughs> any of us who care about those things um, can support. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Uh, to start off, tell us what you do. Um, I am, as you said in the intro, um, I'm an author. I write books, um, mostly nonfiction books about um, about uh, historical events. Um, I'm currently writing a book about how people can be more effective with their anti-racism work. Um, I also write fiction. Uh, I'm an activist and a public speaker, and I've been doing that kind of work for a really long time. I worked as a long time for a teacher, teaching high school and teaching college. Um, but my other big job is that I'm a parent. So uh, especially these days during the pandemic, that's uh, one of my several full-time jobs. So I have a second grader and a sixth grader um, and those are some of the things that I do. What prompted you to become a social activist? You know, I, uh, I was very young. I was around your age, actually, um, when I started to think about um, and, and realize the injustices around me in my own community um, and the larger world. I was a kid who was always interested in the news. I always wanted to watch the news with my parents. I would read the newspaper with my dad every morning. Um, I loved current, anytime we did current events in middle school, you know, that was my absolute favorite thing to do. I loved it. So I just, I always found that stuff interesting. I think my friends thought it was so weird. Nobody else really cared, but I, I don't, I can't explain why I cared about it. I just, I thought it was fascinating and I recognized its importance. Um, and I think that probably around eighth or ninth grade is when I started connecting the things that I was seeing in the news and the larger world um, about injustice to my own community and starting to call out um, racism, mostly against um, my, my Latino community members where I grew up. We had a large um, Mexican-American and Vietnamese-American population. And I started to see um, the racism from the white community that I was a part of. And it made me want to do something about it. That's pretty amazing. And obviously your passion has taken to you taking you to some pretty amazing places. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to say, I share that same passion with you and I see you as a role model. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, I, it's a, it's a cliche thing that grownups say, but when we get to a certain age, we always start saying as how the youth are really, we should look to the youth and the youth of the future. And, you know, one of the truths about all of the great social movements, when we look to the civil rights movement, when we look to Black Lives Matter, when we look to things like the environmental movement and the climate crisis movement, it's young people that have led the way. You know, eventually maybe some older people get the spotlight, um, some politicians get the praise for passing legislation, but historically it's almost always been young people that have been there in the front lines um, really doing the groundwork. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Um, 
Throughout our episodes, we will use the term systemic racism, microaggressions, and prejudice. Can you define those terms? Yes, those are such great terms. So, um, so let's see, microaggression, prejudice, and systemic racism. So systemic racism is the concept that racism is not just acts of individual hatred or prejudice um, that one person does against another. It's the idea that that anti-Black and anti-people of color racism is built into the systems of this country, from the public school system to the criminal justice system to the, our economic system to the housing market. Uh, every system that we interact with um, is impacted by racist policies and histories and legislation. And those histories are never out, even if it happened a long time ago, the ripple effects of those of, of that still affect the systems today. So I think a lot of us are taught that, you know, we say, well, I'm not racist because I've never said a racist thing. And then you can act as if it doesn't exist. But it is about the systems that are in place. Um, so that's my, my quick explainer of systemic racism. Um, Prejudice was the other one. So prejudice is a form of discrimination from an individual um, based on usually an untrue assumption about someone else or a subjective personal bias, right? You don't like someone because of X, Y, or Z. Um, you're prejudiced against them. You judge them in advance and then maybe don't give them the same opportunities, right? It's part of racism, but it is not the same as racism. I would say. Um, and then finally, um, what is a microaggression? And I'm going to use my friend's definition. Um, and my friend Kamau Bell, who I'm um, collaborating with on a book, he says that a microaggression is racism that doesn't get you killed. And I say that with a smile. Uh, Kamau's a comedian. That's a pretty heavy, serious thing to say. But he says it in a comedic but also very serious way. Um, and that microaggressions are what people would say are small forms of, of racism or sexism or homophobia. It's not overt violence. It's not someone yelling a slur in your face. It's the quieter, maybe more subtle things that don't feel subtle to the person on the receiving end. Um, and sometimes I think that that's a problematic term because it makes it seem like those things are not hurtful or not actually a big deal. And um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's maybe things that seem small, but again, for the person who is on the receiving end, um, those are still just as harmful and sometimes can be even worse than the overt acts of, of, of discrimination because they're harder to prove is what I'd say. And this is a longer definition, but when someone yells a slur or violently attacks someone and there's evidence, then that can be proven. But with a microaggression where it's a, a whispered comment or some stares or glances or some things that you know are happening but you can't prove, that's incredibly harmful. And that's what people of color, that's what women, that's what queer people deal with all the time is people not believing what they're actually experiencing and it being hard to prove. I really like those definitions, especially the one about microaggressions because no matter how small the or how concealed the racism is, it's still there. Absolutely. And, you know, I would in a way compare it to an experience that I think a lot of young people have maybe in middle school, you know, you might not get bullied where everybody crowds around you and beats you up in a really public way, but you know how it feels if people maybe um, get together on a weekend and have a birthday party and you're not invited, or if you, you're walking down the hallway and you notice people looking at you and whispering and you can't prove that it's ha really happening, but you can feel it. I would say that's a similar experience, um, again, where it's not a big obvious thing that everybody knows about, but you can still feel it and it hurts. Yeah. I wanted to point out something very important. After the recent killings of innocent Black people, deep issues about racism have been discussed, and a lot of white people want to talk about racism and ask, how can I help? Obviously, people with white privilege can't understand what Black people have gone through and their day-to-day -day struggles. So how can white people get involved in the discussion of racism? Great. Such a great way to phrase it. So what I would say is that uh, as white people, we cannot understand how it feels, but we can do a lot to learn about it. And what we can understand is our own experience as white people. Um, we can work to understand our whiteness and how it contributes to these systems of violence. We can understand our role in our communities 
um, and how we interact with people of color in our communities. Um, and from that place of personal understanding of really looking at ourselves and again, moving away from saying, well, I'm not racist because I've never done a, a, a thing, actually looking really carefully and really deeply at um, our, own, our own biases, our own behaviors, ways in which we've been wrong in the past. And I would also say to go back to the conversation about um, you know, systemic racism, we can understand our histories and our roles in these systems. Um, you know, we can't fix what our ancestors did. I can't go back and change the fact that I am descended from someone who owned slaves and lived on a plantation. That's a thing I've discovered through doing genealogical research. I can't change that. And it's also not my fault that he, that he did that. But I can understand that and I can use that historical knowledge to inform um, how I show up now. So again, when it comes to what, what can I do, how can I get involved, uh, you know, usually there are a lot of, you know, at least there are some local organizations, community-based organizations that someone can join, but I really think that the work starts personally, and it starts in the conversations you have with yourself, um, and then it starts with the conversations you have with other white people, and that's, um, and so, you know, the way you framed the question is that, you know, in the wake of this past year in particular, a lot of conversations about racism have been happening, uh, and it's really important that those conversations happen among um, in, and within white communities, um, as well as with, uh, you know, colleagues of color or friends of color. You know, um, it, it's those conversations have to happen there, too. And I think that's um, one of the most important things white people can do. So engaging in conversations and education, mm -hmm. those are the combined are the key to understanding racism and figuring out how you can help. Absolutely. Talking about it with your friends, with your white friends, um, talking about it with colleagues, you know, being the white person who brings it up first. And especially I'd say for adults, like in a work setting, not always waiting for the other, for the people of color to bring it up, um, but being willing to, to talk about it yourself. And I also think too, a big thing that people can do is to broaden their understanding of the broader experiences of non-white people um, and not just without just focusing only on learning about the trauma, right? We hear the terrible news stories, um, you know, the murder of George Floyd, many people watch the video, you know, we hear about those horrible traumas, but there's a lot more to understanding, um, again, the histories um, and the broader context of the what it what life is like for people who are not white. Uh, and I think another way to do that is in the media that people consume, you know, really thinking about the movies and TV shows and podcasts and trying to diversify your feed um, and listen to other voices because that's the other way. Um, you know, a lot of us live in an echo chamber. You know, some a lot of times we live in relatively segregated communities um, or we're getting one particular viewpoint on social media or on the news. So really trying to watch different TV shows and movies, listen to all kinds of different podcasts, read different books, not just during Black History Month, um, but all throughout the year. On the flip side, a lot of non-marginalized people have seen the movement and said, why should I care? It isn't affecting me. How would you respond to that? Well, if we all walked through life with that point of view, uh, it would be a pretty, it'd be a pretty dismal place, this world. Uh, you don't have to experience something firsthand to care about it. Um, and if that's, and if that is your perspective, I mean, that's just, to me, that's just an unbelievably selfish um, perspective. And I think it goes against what a lot of people would argue are the fundamental, uh, you know, elements of this country of, of, you know, we don't get, there's a famous quote attributed to Fannie Lou Hamer, one of the great civil rights activists, um, which is, you know, nobody's free until everybody's free. And that's something I believe. You know, I, I don't have true freedom um, if, if everybody else around me um, is, is enslaved, um, you know, and I mean that like metaphorical. Um, you know, uh, it's not, it's, that's not real freedom. That's not real peace. If, if just you and your home are safe, but your neighbors are suffering, um, that's not real peace. That's not real safety. So um, I think that if people truly care about those things, then you truly care about the experiences of other people. We all have to work together and support each other, which is really the fundamental value of this country. Absolutely. You know, and, and you see that people do that when we're in crisis, right? Um, we just saw beautiful in, in the state of Texas, where a lot of my family and friends live, and everybody last week was 
without power, without water, and people come together and support each other. That's what communities do, you know. And I would say that when we're talking about racism, that's a crisis. That's a, that's that is a crisis in this country, um, and it is something that people can um, come together to to work on. Um, and 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 part of that for white people is seeing themselves as part of the problem. Um, the ultimate form of white privilege is not ever having to think about race, not ever having to talk about it, it just not ever coming up. That's the ultimate privilege. So moving away from that and seeing ourselves as part of, um, of the problem, right? It's not just racism, it's not just something that happens, it's not a bad thing that happens to people over there. Um, it's actually something that affects all of us. Uh, systemic racism seems like a hard concept for kids to understand. So in my quest to understand it, I watched this YouTube video that I think every kid should watch called Systemic Racism Explained. Great. To any kid watching this episode, I would also recommend reading Stamp by Ibram Kendi and Jason Reynolds, which was eye-opening because it sheds light on how much history was involved in perpetuating racism. My last recommendation is The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, which shows what it's like to live in a dangerous neighborhood nowadays and to experience police brutality firsthand. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Schatz, do you recommend any other resources or any of your books for kids? <laughs> oh, well, I, I would certainly recommend my books. Sure, you know, the most recent book that I wrote is called Rad American History A to Z. Um, so I wrote a book called Rad American Women A to Z, and it's an A to Z book of cool women from American history with a focus on women of color and women that you don't normally learn about in history class, um, like not Susan B. Anthony or Eleanor Roosevelt, even though they're amazing. I wanted to introduce other people. Um, so Rad American History A to Z is not just about individuals. It's about movements and groups of people that made a difference throughout history. So I do touch a lot on these topics in that book, so I would recommend that. I would also, those are great suggestions you had. I um, One thing I'd recommend if people are interested in understanding this idea of systemic racism, um, I think there's a really um, interesting and clear historical, there's a lot of historical examples, but I would suggest that if people are interested in understanding it, um, learning about the history of redlining is a really powerful way to understand um, neighborhoods. So you mentioned the hate you give is about what it's like to live in a, you know, whatever, a, a bad neighborhood. Um, the history of redlining is a really specific way to understand how one thing that happened over the course of a few years can have ripple effects that um, impact communities for decades. Um, and uh, I won't go into a full explainer of it, but I would say Google redlining and redlining maps. And it's, a, it's something that we don't learn about a lot in school, but it can really help you understand how cities and neighborhoods got divided um, because of racism and how that impacted communities for many decades. I think that's a great recommendation because a lot of the disparities right now are from redlining, like um, poor access to schools, um, living in more dangerous neighborhoods, and those are some of the predominant disparities right now. Yep, it's kind of high level stuff in a way, but Basically, it's a history of how Black communities were prevented from owning homes. And in America, under our capitalist economy, home ownership is the fastest and most effective route to gaining wealth and building wealth. Um, and so the very specific ways that Black communities were prevented from owning homes in the 1930s has impacts uh, all over the country today. So Google redlining. Can you give us some historical context for the Black Lives Matter protests? Absolutely. I thought you did a really great job um, outlining it very briefly in, in the beginning. Black Lives Matter was founded by three women, three Black women, Opal Tometi, Patrice Cullors, and Alicia Garza, um, in response to the acquittal of George Zimmerman, who murdered Trayvon Martin. And it started on Facebook. It started as a hashtag. Um, it started as some friends who were hurt and angry saying, you know what, I feel like I feel like our lives don't matter. And then one of them said, you know what, Black lives do matter. And it started from there, but it didn't really start there because they were following in a long tradition of political organizing um, around racial justice. So they were really part of a continuum um, going back through the civil rights movement um, and before the civil rights movement, going back to the labor movement, before the labor movement, going back to anti-lynching movement, um, to abolition, right? This is a long, ever since, um, you know, 
slavery, you know, this country was founded on the twin crimes of the genocide of Native Americans and slavery, right? Both of those things are what we, like this country was founded on. And from the moment that those things have happened, there has been resistance. So from the moment, um, it was only, I, only a few years after the first, um, you know, after slaves began working on plantations, that there was slave rebellions. Um, and that's that's been happening for hundreds of years. So Black Lives Matter really is an extension of years and decades and centuries of organizing. But again, as we know it now, the contemporary version of it started in 2013, and it really caught on more um, during the summer of 2014 or 15, um, when during the protests in Ferguson, Missouri, after the killing of Michael Brown. That's when it really started to show up on posters, on signs, um, and then it's grown from there into a global movement. Um, it started in Oakland, California. That's where I am. So I've had a front row seat um, to the movement. Um, I know I know the organizers. It feels very, um, it's something that has been very present um, here in this community. Um, and it's pretty amazing to see it spread around the globe. Um, it's also extremely misunderstood. Um, it's uh, very polarizing. People think it's a terrorist organization. Um, but to that, I would say that any group or organization or movement that is truly fighting back in effective ways against systems of oppression and power, um, any group like that is going to get pushed back. That's how you know you're really, you're really, it's really working. Uh, going off of what you just said, some media outlets have been portraying the protests as violent in nature, with some even calling the protesters thugs. What is your response to that? Well, that is also, that's nothing new. I mean, my response is that's terrible. And also, that's just not new at all. That is, even the use of words like thugs, um, this is historical language that has been used um, against Black people um, for centuries. So that is nothing new. Um, Daniel, you know, in the in the wake of what we saw on January 6th in the Capitol um, in Washington, D.C., in the white supremacist insurgency, uh, I mean, it's, you know, that's... <laughs> There's no clear example right now of the hypocrisy um, in this country of the continued critique of Black Lives Matter protests that were happening last summer. Um, yes, some of them um, turned mildly violent. Um, yes, there was property damage. Um, you know, yes, sometimes people set fires and turned over police cars. Um, but uh, it was really nothing compared to what we saw. Um, um, you know, in the in the Capitol, and and we also all know what the difference in the response. We saw militarized police forces coming out to stop peaceful Black Lives Matter protests. I've been part of those, and I've seen the police response. And uh, you know, we saw how the people were able to just walk right into the Capitol. Um, that's you know, that's going to be white supremacy one hundred and one examples from here on out. <laughs> Uh, going off of the police, people have been discussing defunding the police. In your words, what do people mean by that? Um, I think people mean different things. A lot of people have different takes on that, but my basic explainer of that would be that the idea of defunding the police um, is not stripping police departments of all of their funds, but rather reallocating um, city money that goes to police departments um, and using it for other city services that can better serve communities. So for instance, taking some of the police budget and using it um, to fund mental health crisis support um, for helping unhoused residents, um, helping with community health care, um, putting some of the money into schools um, and other programs that can help people, right? So right now, when you call, when someone's having a mental health crisis, um, in most communities, there's no other option but to call 911 and to have police show up. That often turns violent and sometimes deadly because police are not always trained to de-escalate and deal with true mental health crises. So to me, defunding the police is about thinking critically, looking at police budgets, looking at city budgets, and thinking of how we can better use our resources to truly protect and support our communities. Sometimes people make inappropriate and racist comments. Sometimes it was done inadvertently, and sometimes it was done deliberately. In my community, there was a thread of people sharing their experiences with racism called Black Main Line. Most of these threads were high school students who experienced racism from their peers and teachers. If you ever come across a racist or inappropriate comment on verbally or on social media, how should you respond? Well, you should always call it out, okay? The silence is violence. And sometimes one thing I, rec and that's not easy, 
you know, so I want to acknowledge that it's hard. If you are in a group of friends and someone tells a joke that is racist, um, you know, it's, it can be hard to speak up. So one thing I recommend, especially for young people, but adults too, is to actually practice. That might sound silly, but think about, imagine what you might say when that happens and actually practice it. Like look in the mirror and rehearse what you would say. And it doesn't have to be yelling at somebody. It can be something as simple of like, whoa, what did you just say? And that's one way that I like to do it is actually at making the person repeat what they said. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What was that? Um, or wait, did you really just say that? Or is that something you really believe? Um, and that way it puts it back on them. Um, and it could, But it's also important to talk from your own perspective and say, hey, that I didn't appreciate that. And one thing, Daniel, people will often say, well, that wasn't my intent. Or, well, I didn't mean it that way. And I think a very important thing to think about and explain to people is that it's not about intent, it's about impact. So when we talk about racism, the intent of somebody doesn't matter. What really matters is the impact. So if I say something and I didn't mean for it to be hurtful, but it hurt you, that's the impact, then I need to know that and I need to work on that. And it's the same way that I always say that if I bumped into you and I stepped on your foot and it really hurt and you said, ow, my response should be, I'm so sorry, are you okay? Is there anything I can do? Not, well, I didn't see you. It's not my fault. I didn't mean to step on your foot, right? What matters is what the actual impact is. And that's really hard for people, but it's quite important. So um, in whatever way you feel comfortable with, you should absolutely always call it out, even if it makes things uncomfortable, um, because in the long run, it is absolutely the right thing to do. I think that's some great advice. And I really like that analogy of stepping on someone's foot. Mm -hmm. We've had a great discussion. We talked about the systemic racism woven into our country, how we can help the Black Lives Matter protests, responding to racist comments, and engaging in discussions about racism. Thank you so much for being on the show, Ms. Schatz. It was really, it was really an amazing experience being with you. Um, it was an amazing experience for me, Danielle. You know, I'll say that uh, I often say that, you know, sometimes adults will think that um, young people um, can't handle difficult information or that, you know, oh, talking about racism or talking about this is too much for them. They, they won't understand it. And I always say, you know what, young people understand justice and right and wrong better than anybody and they can handle complicated things. Um, and it's, uh, no one is born into this world racist. No one's born racist. No one is born with hate. That is all learned, right? And, it, and, and, if, and that means that if it's learned, it can all be unlearned. So thank you for being part of that process of unlearning. Um, it's incredibly important, and I'm happy to have this conversation. Thank you. That's a very powerful message that you're not born with racism. Yeah. Thank, thank you again for being on the show. To all of our viewers, I hope you will watch our next episode. I'm Daniel Adibi, and I'll see you soon.